Welcome to the FMCG In Crowd, where people come together to talk about topics that matter to the FMCG industry. Hello and welcome to the FMCG In Crowd. So this is a podcast from IRI about the fast moving consumer goods sector, which from here on in I shall abbreviate to FMCG. Um, the, the sector itself, the technology, the people that power it, and ultimately the insights that will drive the industry forward. So I'm your host, Chloe Humphreys-Page, I'm the Marketing Manager for IRI. Um, And this FMCG industry in which we work is a great web of friends and connections and contacts. And at IRI, we're so lucky to sit slap bang in the middle of that. And this podcast series aims to bring people together to share experiences, learnings, expertise, and opinion, and I'm really excited about it. So in this, our first episode, we're kicking off um, with a discussion about innovation, new product development in the FMCG sector. So what it delivers to the end consumer, but also some of the key considerations that manufacturers and retailers should take into account when developing a new product. And I have got a great group of guests today. So first up, we have got a colleague of mine, Jamie Sylvester, who heads up um, retail at IRI. Hello, Jamie, and thanks for joining us. Bringing us the view from the retailer, we have got Michelle Rowley, who heads up uh, innovation, new product development at Co-op. From the manufacturing side, we've got Holly Ferguson. She's a senior brand manager working on Nescafe within Nestle. And then rounding off our insight, we've got Lucy Smith, who's the co-founder of AdSalt, which is a company you might have heard us talk about before, a a purpose-driven brand accelerator whose sole aim is to bring diversity into the retail industry and accelerate brand success. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining me. So I am going to start with my first question. I'm going to fire it at Holly in a non-aggressive, non-threatening way. (laughs) So Holly, you are senior lead on... I think I'm right in saying the UK's largest instant coffee brand. Yes, indeed. (laughs) So what do you see as the role of MPD? What do you think it delivers to the category, to the shopper, to the consumer? Yeah, it's a good question. It can do a lot of different things. I think that's the first thing to say. But for me, I think the utopia um, of what grey MPD uh, can deliver is, and this sounds a bit corporate, so excuse me, but the real triple win, like thinking about, okay, first of all, and I would say first and foremost, what can it deliver for consumers? You know, how can you deliver against like a kind of real genuine consumer need or maybe um, overcome a challenge for a consumer with a real kind of crispy insight, something that's really real? And then the second part of that is obviously for your company or, or for your brand, how can it deliver value? Often, you know, the goal here is like incremental um, RSV, for example, or sometimes it's bringing new shoppers into your brand. And then uh, importantly, um, for the kind of retailer, for your customer, for your category, how can it maybe deliver something that, you know, the category hasn't been able to tap into before? Maybe it's an area of consumption in our case, and maybe it's going after those consumers that just have never managed to engage in the category. There's something stopping them coming in. I think those are the kind of things that NPD as a kind of tactic you know, specifically can deliver against something's more than um, some of our other tactics in marketing. I completely agree with what Ali said, and it's it's back to the consumer for me, really. But for the role of MPD in innovation for us at Co-op is really to keep our ranges relevant and interesting for our customers. So like MPD is always going to be important in that space to keep it fresh and, and to keep it timely and on point. But like Holly said, back to the consumer, back to the problems, to their needs and, and providing solutions for people in that space, whether it be something to treat themselves with or something to make you feel better about yourselves in terms of health and, and sustainability in the way forward. Yeah, and, and, and that's something we hear more and more about, isn't it? This kind of consumer centricity, this um, consumer first approach, not, not just to um, brand development, but for retailing full stop. So do you think that has become more important? Do you think that's changed in any way in the last few years? Yeah, I think it's more and more important. I think for in in my role as a convenience retailer, we have 
small stores, a wide, diverse customer base, and we serve different communities and different areas. So being customer centric and knowing what people need and want from you down to specific stores, specific areas of the UK becomes even more important because actually investing in MPD and innovation is expensive, isn't it? So we need to be really clear on what we're delivering in that space and that it provides that solution that people are looking for. Customers are demanding more of us now in MPD and innovation. They need us to be there to help support them in making choices that they buy within food and drink. And we've seen, uh, you know, food and drink trends and response across the industry just accelerate massively over the last few years. And it's no longer good enough to just be bringing out new and exciting products like consumers are really looking for us to make ranges healthier, more sustainable, more ethical in terms of, of going through. And that all becomes a nice big melting pot of what's important within MPD. I just want to bring Jamie in at this point, because um, with your kind of retail insights hat on, do you see um, in the work that you're doing with your retail partners, do you see that kind of customer and shopper first element playing a stronger role in the work you're doing? Absolutely. You know, it's a, it's a trend we're seeing across all retailers around how they can bring that customer understanding right into the, the full range review process. So understanding what are the customer needs states, what are the emerging trends? And I think to, to Michelle's point, the fact that everything is escalating in terms of speed and the speed that the customers want to get get hold of the trends that are coming out into the market and being able to be agile enough to jump on that quickly. Um, I know we've spoken before, but I think flavoured gin is a great example of this. It, it was this trend that erupted out of nowhere. And if you weren't quick enough to jump in and, and bring your innovation out, suddenly you were a me too rather than a, a brand leader in at the forefront. So being able to act with, with speed and, and kind of really pinpoint those emerging customer trends is critical. The majority of retailers will have a specific customer that, that they're, they're looking to target. Um, if you look at Waitrose and Marks and Spencer, it's very much at that premium end. How do they bring out innovation that's going to, to meet the needs of their, their core customer base? Co-op, for example, it's about convenience. Uh, how, how do they jump onto to when a customer is, is thinking about convenience? Um, I think for the, for the big four, it's, it's very much thinking about how they, they position innovation in line with their, their strategy around pricing, around um, you know, what, what they want their range to, to be like and, and how do they want customers to kind of move and shop within the store. So I think it's not just thinking about the customer themselves, but also thinking about the mission um, that the, the customer is on when they're coming into store and how they meet that, that mission, because the customer may be thinking in a very different way if they're going into a co-op versus doing their, their weekly shop in a Tesco and, and how you kind of tap into the mind state of the customer at the point of time that they're in store. And you must really um, have to dig into that, Michelle, given you know, the um, widespread kind of locations of, of co-op stores and the different shopper missions. How does that how does that play into your thinking? It plays into my thinking every day. So, uh, yeah, missions is the right word. So we have um, some stores, for example, within our state that are heavy food to go stores that, that used to uh, go from uh, shopping traffic of people working in towns and cities. Obviously, that, that's changed over the last year or so to some stores that actually is the only store in someone's village or area that people use on a daily or really regular basis for their top up shopping and everyday needs. So we need to be really, really close to that, really understand our store estate and make sure that we're launching the right products in the right areas. And sometimes that means going smaller on our launches to start with rather than a big bang across the whole of our estate. Actually, it leads me on to another question. So Holly, I'm, I'm going to bring you in at this point, if I may. So thinking about um, the, the kind of new opportunities and challenges and, and um, the, the whole kind of, um, I suppose, evolution of MPD. I know you and I have spoken a little bit about this before around um, the the expectations of NPD and the criteria for success. So I, we, we hear quite a bit from conversations we've had um, with clients who feel that the success criteria has evolved and will continue to evolve and become more stringent. But 
what what are your thoughts on that? Do you think expectations of MPD have changed, are changing? It's an interesting question and I feel like I read every single day about how everything in marketing is changing um, and nothing's going to be the same ever again and this seems especially a prevalent line when you talk about innovation. From my point of view, I think what is always changing is the context in which we're operating in, you know, whether it's to do with new media channels, you know, new ways to access your consumer, new retailer pressures, new government legislation that, you know, impacts, um, you know, launches like, you know, HFSS and things like this, um, you know, retailer um, range rationalisation, you know, all these things. I would call that, you know, the, the context in which you're trying to launch your innovation or you're trying to be successful and I think that is definitely changing and, you know, so much so, especially at the moment. But I personally don't think the expectations of what NPD should or, or can deliver is chain, it has changed, really. I think, you know, it's still when we think back to, um, you know, what NPD should do in terms of delivering that triple win. I think that has always been what, what certainly from a brand point of view, we've expected our innovation to do. Um, we've always wanted to have these kind of big launches that deliver against real consumer needs and drive you know a lot of incremental value to your brand. I think that that hasn't really changed. And if I think to how we kind of set KPIs in our process, we set kind of three or four key success criteria at the beginning of the project that the whole cross-functional team kind of co-creates and signs off on. And those really are frozen and shouldn't change throughout the whole process. And they kind of fall into three camps. The first is normally a kind of commercial value-based one. The second is normally a, a shopper um, target, whether it's who you're targeting or a number of shoppers you bring in. And then the third is really project-specific and increasingly becoming about, you know, com- um, contribution to sustainability, the planet, healthy diets, etc. So, yeah, I think context for me is changing all the time, but the expectations of NPD for me is is kind of been, been a constant even through these turbulent times. I can totally understand what you're saying about the the, the core um, requirement of MPD and the reason for MPD doesn't change. I, I suppose I wonder, are, are people as patient maybe for MPD now to prove itself? Are people giving it um, as much time, less time? That I suppose that's kind of behind my question. Well, have you noticed any difference at all from that respect? I think certainly when you think about the context of, um, you know, often you're trying to get an NPD listed where there needs to be a net zero skew count change. So in other words, you have to replace something, an, an existing product that's delivering value for a category in order to list your NPD. I think that definitely brings probably additional pressures in that it really needs to deliver on your size of prize estimation um, you can't be plucking this big number out of thin air because if you're going to delist something to list this, you need to be pretty sure um, on your kind of business plan. So I think that definitely brings additional pressures. And yeah, this kind of um, sense of urgency around, um, you know, when is an MPD delivering? What is it delivering? I think, yeah, in general, we need to be careful with that kind of short termist attitude, is my opinion in marketing, and that we can be too knee jerk to try and say, that's working, that's not working. And actually to really embed something and, and you know, make that a nation, or in, in our case, when we're a mass, mass awareness brand, make a nation aware of something, it takes time. And, you know, you can't often do that in three months. So, yeah, sometimes we do have those difficult conversations with retailers, but generally there is a good kind of common understanding on, OK, let's give it until this amount of time and see if it's delivered against these kind of hurdle rates and then make a make a call together. Because I suppose of the scale of the brands, the brand that you work on, I mean, it, it's a hefty, hefty brand. And, and I wonder how, how do you marry the need for scale? Because, you know, an MPD from Nescafe, you would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, would, would, the expectation would be that you would deliver some big, big numbers um, with that desire for innovation and creativity. It's a really good question. Um because sometimes you can feel there's a bit of an internal tension. You know, you're working a huge company on a big brand and it's act like a startup. And I'm like, I'm not a startup, but I'll try. Um, so, yeah, sometimes that is a bit of a tension. But, you know, we need to look at our role in the category. And as a brand, you know, we're a category leader. Um, you know, we're in an in a instant coffee category that's drunk by 80% of the nation. You know, it's, it's really, you know, in nearly every kitchen cupboard in the UK. So, yes, definitely. 
um, the majority of our NPD should be delivering, you know, significant category value. Um, you know, we're in a really fortunate position that we have, you know, a leadership position and the, you know, value of NPD launched in the past few years and things, um, which is great. And that is our job and we should be doing that. But also there is still a role, you know, in every category, there's kind of unmet needs that are often a bit niche or begin niche and then can be scaled. An example probably in our category is, it maybe isn't a surprise to you that a young people, so, you know, under kind of 25 really, or under 35, there's a very low penetration of instant coffee and it's really a much older demographic. You know, that's a challenge a lot of big and small brands have tried to crack and, you know, often haven't done so very successfully. But one of our brands, Nescafe Azira, um, and it goes after this in a much more targeted way, it does some super cool things and um, working with kind of students to launch like creative designs. And um, they've recent we've recently launched um, something Lucy and I actually worked on in the very beginning, a kind of craft coffee um, NPD. So it's really speciality instant coffee that was developed in collaboration with an independent coffee roaster in Manchester. Now, this is something that is starting very, very small. You know, it's a very small collaboration with a small, independent, amazing business. But, and yeah, in, in, in the initial stages, it's going to deliver small as well. But we believe it has huge category potential over the long term. And so that can also be our role to kind of seed something that we believe has scalable potential. Innovation in FMCG is, is really, really tough. And um, and we're, we're seeing that more and more so. If you look at the, the first quarter of 2020, um, the amount of innovation in the market was down 24% versus what we saw last year. Um, and although you, you could say that, that that's due to the pandemic, but we didn't really see retailers consciously pull back on launching innovation during the last year. We did see um, messages coming out very clearly that innovation has to work harder. Um, it has to deliver better returns for, for, the, um, for the category because space is at a premium. Um, but, but it is tough and, and it's getting tougher. Um, you know, we've seen so far innovation that's been launched in 2020, only 8.2% of that innovation has proven successful um, by delivering, you, you know, on average 75% of the, the average retail sales that we see for that category. So, so it, is, it is tough and, and it is about how you find that niche and, and get it out there, um, hitting on those customer trends that we spoke about earlier. I want to talk about um, pricing. Um, because everyday low pricing or EDLP um, is a perennial conversation, but has definitely grabbed the headlines over the past 12 to 18 months. Um, price comparisons are kind of ubiquitous now. And yet the generally accepted kind of wisdom, for want of a better phrase, um, of launching MPD is it launches at a price premium. So how, how appropriate do you think it is these days um, for, for brands to be launching at a price premium, given all of these overriding pressures on, on retail price? I think innovation is, is a great way of driving value in a category if it offers something unique and different and, and offers something that, that commands that, that premium price. Um, just being new isn't enough to, to get customers to spend more. You, you know, there has to be something unique about that proposition. But saying that, of those 8.2% of successful innovation lines that, are, that I just spoke about, um, a third of those came with a lower price point than, than the category average. So actually looking at, at trading customers down. Um, and Michelle spoke earlier about the, you know, the everyday value launch within, within co-op. It's about getting that balance of you, you know, the, the customer need because everyday low price is a, a very relevant customer need at the moment um, and you know innovation has to keep up with that um, but what we're also seeing is that the promoted sales are down of innovation as well so um, you, you, promotions are down 60 percent versus last year in terms of, of innovation and with the high fat sugar salt regulations coming in there's going to be um, less space, I guess, within store to, to get innovation off shelf, to get it on a gondola end where it can signpost the newness, I guess, of, of that, that line and, and bring customers down, down the aisle to, to shop the category. So innovation has to work harder both on delivering value, but also on, on delivering something unique. I think back to the beginning in terms of MPD and, and a price premium, it's, it's got to be around value for money that we're offering our shoppers. So yes, people do want 
um, lower price kind of basics in the areas, but actually it needs to be underpinned by levels of trust and quality within that as well, so that people really know what they're paying for. Um, we know from our customers that people are still looking to buy, it's a bit old fashioned now, trade up treats and like treats for special occasions, but that might not be something really expensive. That might be something that's 50p or a pound that actually puts a smile on people's faces. And again, back to like being convenient, people are still willing to pay a bit for convenience. So convenient meal for tonight solutions, convenient ways to treat themselves and their families so they don't have to go out or don't have to venture further to get things. And that's still really important for us. But that's where we're seeing uh, things like well-known brands really do well in this space because they've built that trust and, and, and that credibility. So while people are still willing to pay that bit more, they need to trust what they're doing so people are less willing to be risky with their outlays in, in terms of money as well. So we need to get it right. And that does put more pressure on what's expected of MPD now more than maybe a few years ago. Yeah, I, I can I can see that. And um Lucy, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you back in now, talking about this kind of pressure and the need to get it right, the pressure on ranges. We've we all have all seen, I'm sure, um the, the headlines of, you know, big assortment kind of reductions, pressure on space. Um, and, and it makes me kind of wonder what the impact of that will be on the innovation pipeline. And so, Lucy, from, from a kind of brand startup perspective, how difficult is it for those new brands to get off the ground and to get on the shelf? Have you noticed that get harder Definitely. And to be honest, it's one of the reasons why we're here. Um, so at Ad Salt, part of the program, actually, we work with um, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, uh, Waitrose and Ocado, and they work with our brands to try and get them ready for retail and have different discussions. Um, and in the last range of discussions they had with our brands, one of them was around, I suppose, their activation plans, around the amount of awareness these brands, I suppose, need to have in order to, um, how would you say, you know, like almost like the push-pull model, if that makes sense, um, because they're not going to have the big budgets of big brands like a Nescafe or like a Nescafe Zero when a product, when a, something launches, they're not going to be able to sort of advertise in that way to pull them in. So I think that within itself, it's it's a huge pressure for these startups. Um, and then second to this as well, in regards to the rate of sales that these guys, these different startup brands need to meet in order to maintain that listing, um, there's there's a lot of pressure there, um, so it is. It's increasingly difficult for um, I suppose these brands to get into retail, um, but there are different programs. I suppose different retailers are doing to try and help this. Like Sainsbury's obviously has the Future Brands team. Um, Tesco has a brand incubator as well, um, and these are essentially custom built to try and help these smaller startup brands again get that foot in the door. Um, I think what's been great, though, over essentially the last few years, but really stepping it up the last year, is the direct-to-consumer model and how much consumers now, they sort of had to rely on it slightly, didn't they, um, during COVID, but how much that stepped up. And then so for these challenger brands and these startup brands, um, it's it's something that they did, probably didn't have sort of, you know, 10, 15 years ago at their disposal and consumers weren't going uh, and shopping in that way. So that within itself, even though there are challenges within retail, there are so many different other avenues opening up now, um, which is really amazing. And I think certainly is helping a lot of these challenger and sort of startup brands um, get, get off the ground. And actually, that, that is a, a lovely segue to my next question, which was about um, the, the topic of channel shifting. So I think we could probably have an entire episode on its own um, talking about channel shifting. So, you know, whether that be direct to consumer that you mentioned Lucy or the growth of online the rise of the omni shopper which makes me think of some kind of sci-fi sci-fi film um particularly as you say over the last 12 months but it was coming anyway um and some of those habits that we have got into over the last 12 months undoubtedly will stick not all but some so um interesting what you were saying about um how it's given opportunities for those startups but I also wonder does it does it pose any challenges, maybe for the for the more established um, brands? What what do you think, um, Holly? What do you think it means for um, 
something like a Nescafe, this proliferation of, of channels? The first thing I would say is I think it makes you have to think more critically about your launch plans. I mean, you always should be, but sometimes with all these new toys, all these new glittery new bits of things you could do, it's very tempting to say, oh, let's do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then you forget, well, wh why would I be doing that? Um, so I think, first of all, you have to think of it more critically and not be lured into the new toys. But mainly, I think it, it presents a lot more opportunities um, in terms of, you know, direct consumer. Certainly, that that's one thing. It comes with, yeah, we have a lot of our, our coffee brands that have fantastic direct consumer models um, and have very successful businesses off the back of that. The likes of Nescafe Dolce Gusto and Espresso. Um, but we also have an incredible um, kind of instant coffee portfolio that doesn't have any direct consumer model and really the majority of our business is still in kind of bricks and mortar and um, retail stores and I think yes the right we you know the rise in e-commerce is something that you know we've all been upskilling as a, as a total Nescafe team completing a whole new e-business academy over the past year to kind of get ourselves ready to play more in this space but I think we also shouldn't forget that it's still about in our business about seven percent of total sales, so still the vast majority um, of where we need to be driving value is still in a more traditional um, you know, retail setting, let's say. A thought um, has occurred to me um, while we've been talking, and actually, Michelle, it's a, it's a question for you. Um, from an own brand perspective, just thinking about um, the, going, going back to bricks and mortar, knowing that it's the most important channel for most, most businesses, um, from an own brand perspective, have you seen any kind of evolution, either from a micro or a macro space perspective, when it comes to own brand? And I'm thinking specifically of kind of the ratio of brand to own brand. And I'd like to understand a bit more about the thinking that goes into that ratio. Is that is that something you can share? Yeah, so um, I think I think it touches on a few topics that we've talked about today. So, and I'll go back to like diverse diverse store estate, but also um, product ranges and stuff. And when we're looking at bringing MPD in, whether it's own brand or branded, whether it's the the big players like Holly or the smaller players like Lucy that we've been talking a lot about, it's going back to the role that it brings. So, we'd have a look at the products that we wanted to launch and the role that that plays within the category, but also the category itself and the role that that has to play within a store and the role of the store and then what the consumers need from that store. So that that was a, a long-winded answer, Chloe, but there's a lot of thought that goes into that in terms of the balance of own label versus brands, the balance of new brands um, uh, versus big old school brands that are operating within the market. So it's complex and it differs per category, but it is, it is thought through because own brand for us brings us um, distinctiveness versus the other retailers. But actually with that rise of challenger brands coming through, they can play into to that space as well. So it becomes really interesting for us. Yeah, makes sense. I have one, I think one final question actually, which is around um, speed and agility. So. I feel, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, um, that there is a definite um, desire, ambition to be um, more agile, to respond more rapidly, to go faster. Um, you know, whether that's responding to trends, whether that's um, you know delivering projects, whatever it might be, there is a definite pace um, change over the last two years. Um, maybe longer, but certainly it's accelerated in recent times. What kind of friction does that cause, this need to be agile and fast with this quite lengthy, stage-gated um, process? Lucy, I'm going to fire that one at you. So I've worked for a number of sort of big businesses in my career, um, Nestle, Kellogg's, McVitie's, Danone, Tata. So in regards to stage gate and I suppose the stage gate process with an innovation, um, for many years I've worked with it. I think, honestly, it's a brilliant process. The rigour um, is needed there in order to get something from A to Z. Um, and I, I think absolutely it's certainly needed. 
One of the reasons probably that I moved away though from working in sort of big corporates and trying to work more with sort of SMEs and smaller um, smaller brands is in regards to, I just love working at pace to be honest. I, I'm i probably one of those um, annoying people internally that cuts a few corners and sort of was a bit dodgy with the gate process. It's Holly swallowing laughing because <laughs> she would know. Um, but the funny thing is what I actually do now um, with AdSalt and then also I have a brand and innovation consultancy, Funk Consulting, and we actually focus on taking, how would you say, um, the process, the rigour, the good stuff from what corporates do, but trying to apply them to SMEs and startups. Something I found in the AdSalt work actually was I actually developed a process which it was based on the stage gate process, um, but it was a lot of stuff was pulled out of it. And we tried to get our brands, or we're working to get our brands and sort of take them through an innovation relaunch in 18 weeks. One of the things that I have found actually is probably even more rigor needs to be put back in um, because it's there for a reason. Um, and probably one of the reasons, even from a startup perspective, you do hear of brands and you see them. And even this might be one of the reasons why a lot of brands fail sort of when they do go into retail that are startups is that rigor, that thought, that strategy probably isn't there so much. I've worked even in my time sort of working with startups with a few different ones that a bit of sort of throwing mud at the wall, what sticks, not quite sure, versus right, this is where we are, this is sort of my consumer sort of insight, this is my brand strategy, this is my pipeline, and this is exactly how I'm going to get it from A to Z. So the rigor, the process is needed. There's a reason why stage gate is it's a global process that everyone sort of uses in different shapes or form. But I think probably from a consumer need, the pace is increasing. Um, so bigger businesses are needing to find ways to be more flexible. But let's not ignore that there's still big businesses with about 100 people that need to sign something up in the line. But then at the same time, the smaller businesses still need that rigor. But it's just probably a little, there's like two people signing it off versus 100 um, so stage gate, rigor, process, it's definitely needed. But I think depending on the, the different sort of scale of your business, different levels of flexibility. Yeah, it reminds me of your point earlier, Holly, about um, act like a startup, but I'm not a startup, but I'll try. <laughs> I think it's, there's times where you, for example, um, I hope nobody in the Nest Cafe team minds, us, minds me outing us on this point. But there, once upon a time, we took over one year, over a year, to get an idea of a new flavor of a of a latte from an idea of what the new flavor is going to be to being on a shelf. You know, there is no excuse for something taking that long. That is just something's going really wrong in the process. Um, but I'm happy to say since then... And we have a much more flexible, much better kind of idea to launch process in which you can go in at any point. You have one approver, you don't have 25 approvers anymore. And now we can do that in like four months, um, which is about the time I think, you know, you should be doing that. It's basically about the time it takes to order the new flavor. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes you just need to get rid of the process where it's not adding value. But on a really long term, really, you know, category, new category first kind of you know, technology innovation, those things do take a long time. And often the rigor, like Lizzie says, is completely needed because maybe nobody's gone after that before. You really have no idea what it could deliver and how it should be launched. So I think it's just about, you know, taking the time when you need it and going fast when you just need to go and get out there. Calculated risks, I think, is the the, the, the best thing to sort of think through and not doing something for the sake of doing it, but not just doing something and not thinking about it as well is also something that um, never ends well. So it's it's been a, it's been a massive part of my day to day conversations at co op as well. I mean, we we touch a lot of products a year and and take them through our staging gate, and actually a, a bit of a reflection on like the last year in lockdown. It's really made us think differently about what we do and the kind of levels of sign off that we go through and, and how many people are involved in that process. So you can you can see we've started to make it a bit more efficient by actually stopping some stuff and doing it a little bit differently. That's that's felt uncomfortable, but kind of nece necessary at some point points I think um, there is always going to be a role for agile innovation and bringing things in quickly but 
like you guys said, it's that balance and making sure that we don't take everything through that route. Because what you don't want to miss out on is something that takes a year or two years to develop and having that team really focused on the longer term too, especially when we're talking about technology and new ingredients. Yeah. And I, and how, how would you make the distinction, Michelle, between something that can be classified as agile innovation and something else which needs longer? So agile innovation for me is something that we've got a concept pretty much ready to go. It aligns behind all the insight. It aligns behind our strategic direction of our business and therefore becomes a bit of a no brainer. We know the suppliers that we might want to work with. They have the the capacity and, and the technology in place to deliver it. And therefore you can really get behind something and go, right, we're going to launch this quickly. We're going to make it timely. We're going to launch it. And, and timely is not the same as quick, the right time of year in the right places to, to give that the best chance of success. And I think relating to an earlier point around keeping MPD in long enough to give it a really good go and actually being agile enough to say, oh, we've launched that, That's it's kind of right, but maybe we put it in the wrong places or maybe we didn't activate it enough and actually going around again and learning from, from those challenges and giving it the chance to succeed without throwing it in the bin too early. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, um, so I think that's a really good point to end on, actually. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I, I don't know about you, but I think that was a really interesting discussion. I, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, and I think we the key takeouts for me are definitely, I heard loud and clear many times about being consumer-focused. So that needs to that the MPD needs to meet a genuine consumer need. The pressure on space is greater than ever, and therefore you have to have a compelling proposition for your brand, which probably is not is not new news. And also we touched on the the pressure of speed and when it is and when it isn't appropriate to um, to maybe cut out some of those stage gate processes. Although Lucy, not the important ones. I heard that loud and clear. I heard that loud and clear. So don't be too lean. Don't be too lean. <laughs> too lean. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, it's been lovely to have you. So uh, take care and see you soon. Thank you for listening. Keep a lookout for another episode of the FMCG In Crowd.